Okay, for the rest of tonight, we're going to do the decolonization movement. Um, I like to do this right after the Cold War because the Cold War rivalries have a big impact on what the world looked like after the end of World War II. So decolonization is really a merger of the end of World War II because World War II just bankrupted and destroyed the Europeans, obviously. Therefore, a lot of the European countries that had far-flung worldwide empires, Britain, France, uh, even Germany and Italy to a smaller extent, um, they just couldn't afford to keep them anymore. And so they, were, they had very tough choices to make throughout the world about what areas they would try to keep control of, if any, and uh, how they would try to exert control over some areas while others were becoming independent countries. So you see a kind of dovetailing of the end of World War II and the rise of these newly independent countries that will have national elections and they get thrown into the politics of the Cold War because the United States and Soviet Union start looking for allies throughout the world as these new countries are emerging. So it's a very uh, kind of troublesome thing to go through historically because it's happening all over the world virtually at the same time. So it's very confusing. Uh, so I try to limit it to just a few of the biggest problem areas uh, that continue to be very problematic even right through to today. So a lot of these kinds of relations are, or relationships are happening. Uh, Southeast Asia, that's where the Vietnam War comes from. Um, South Asia with India and Pakistan. Uh, the Middle East, particularly with Israel and Palestine, but also the emergence of Iraq, Syria, um, Iran, uh, coming out of really uh, European control since the end of World War I. And the newly independent movement, of especially Latin America, uh, that obviously the U.S. gets heavily involved in, and Africa. So this is happening literally all over the world, almost at the same time. It's very chaotic. And uh, the politics of the Cold War impact these things very heavily. Uh, first one I'll go through is Israel and Palestine, because they have direct relationships to what happened in World War II, largely the Holocaust that the Germans had inflicted uh, throughout Central, or throughout almost all of Europe, going into the Soviet Union. Uh, so Hitler had called this the War of Annihilation, basically the, one of the attempts to eradicate what he considered to be the lesser, weaker races and the ones that he blamed for German problems uh, throughout the world. And uh, he picked out the Jews as really number one on his hit list. Uh, the Jews were only the first on the list, and it was a very long list. Um, Hitler is obviously a very devoted racist. So he would have wanted to eliminate a lot of the other minorities throughout the world, and you know, the Jews were just the first. Uh, but obviously after this War of Annihilation, a lot of the Jewish survivors of World War II, uh, which are not that many compared to how many there were before the war started, uh, they don't want to be in Central Europe anymore, for obvious reasons. They're afraid. They have a very um, bad memory of what had happened to them. Families, societies were eradicated and whatnot. Uh, so a lot of European Jews just don't want to be in Europe anymore. And they advocate to, to get a country of their own somewhere in the world. And there's not a lot of debate. There is a lot of debate internationally about where that country would be located. There's a lot of debate about the United States maybe opening its borders to mass immigration of Jews, uh, especially into the northeastern United States, uh, centered around New York City. Um, eventually... A new state of Israel is carved out of a place in the Middle East along the eastern Mediterranean Sea. Uh, in that area, largely because it had ancient ties to an ancient state of Israel and a state called Judah that had existed in antiquity, in ancient times, um, led by people like Solomon and King David and whatnot. So there are a lot of international calls, not just from Jewish groups themselves, to get a country carved out of that type of area. The problem is that there's already a lot of people living in that area by the 1940s. Um, so after 1945, there's this call, and they start looking at different parts of the world to put them. And uh, the United States doesn't get involved in those discussions for quite a long time because they realize it would be a foreign policy disaster to put Israel, the new state of Israel, in a place especially where it eventually went. Um, the United States government under the Truman administration made decisions at the highest levels in the spring of 1948 to support the creation of Israel uh, where it is today. 
or largely where it is today in the eastern Mediterranean. Does anyone want to take a guess at why that happened in the spring of 48? Because that was a presidential election year. And there are many accusations that President Truman made this decision on his own without the hearing the advice of a lot of his foreign policy leaders, especially George Kennan was very much against this. And Kennan said that if you do this, it'll be a U.S. foreign policy disaster for decades and decades. Who knows when it would end? Because the people living in that area would not be happy that you are basically taking their land. So uh, Israel is put into place in 1948 has immediate problems. Number one, uh, people are already living there and they are displaced. And they're not happy about it and they're still not happy about it right to this very moment. Uh, the eventual population in original Israel is only one-third Jewish. So even all the European uh, Jews who moved into this area and a lot of international Jews who move into the area, they still only make up about a third of the population of Israel itself. And they start to even then define themselves as a Jewish state. Another major problem is you have this pan-Islamic movement that's been discussed since at least the late 1800s throughout the greater Middle East, going all the way from Western Egypt all the way through uh, Persia, old Persia, which um, is called Iran. So there are dreams of a kind of Muslim super state to either rebuild or replace the old Ottoman Empire. And Israel going in with European and U.S. backing seems to be a, a real dagger in the heart of that kind of dream. So a lot of uh, Muslims, or what people would call a kind of radical Islamists today, um, who want to see an Islamic state built in this region, are very much offended at the creation of Israel and view it as a, an attempt to stop the creation of a pan-Islamic state. Um, other countries are built along Israel's borders, so they're literally redrawing the map. Um, probably the most important one is Lebanon, which was created to basically be a Christian haven in the area. Um, pieces of Lebanon are carved out of the ex existing country of Syria. So Lebanon is way up here, kind of in the corner, uh, carved out of existing Syria at that point. And the Syrians aren't very happy about that. And in fact, so many uh, Muslim immigrants move into Lebanon that the idea of a like, Christian majority state is just overwhelmed eventually to the point where Lebanon eventually becomes a, a Muslim majority state also. So even the neighbors that are carved out on the map to be somewhat friendly to Israel, uh, eventually just their immigration and the politics of voting uh, become very hostile toward Israel almost immediately. Uh, particularly Syria, and as Egypt becomes basically independent and there's a coup in Egypt, uh, the new Egyptian leadership will be very much devoted to the idea of uh, invading Israel or taking back some of the land or something like this. So does that make sense? So right off the bat, Israel is surrounded uh, by hostile countries and hostile populations. So why did they pick that place then? Um, Just for ancient reasons, uh, also because a lot of Jews wanted access to Jerusalem, one of the major holy sites for their religion, and also happens to be the holy site for three different major religions, so that's a problem. Um, and that's one of their uh, Israel's demands right down to this day, that they get to dominate Jerusalem, which other people are not very happy about. Um, but there's a lot of ancient ideas and also a lot of internal pol internal political debate, especially within the United States. The theory being that um, if the president wouldn't support this stuff, uh, the Jewish population in the United States would vote almost unanimously against him for some other candidate and knock him out of office. So there's a lot of internal political dialogue and there's a lot of sympathy for the Jewish population after World War II for obvious reasons, right? just as there is today. Okay, um, very quickly after the creation of Israel, there is a coup in 1952 in Egypt. The Egyptian government up to 1952 was the same old holdovers, basically a royal family um, that had been in place since uh, the wake of Napoleon. 
And one after another, that royal family had ruled Egypt as basically an autonomous government, an independent government. Um, They were very pro-Western for a long time, and a lot of the Egyptian population had had enough of it. And there was a, literally a military coup against that monarchy, uh, what had become a monarchy by that time. Um, there's struggle for power within Egypt for a couple years until eventually the, a military leader named Colonel Nasser takes control. And Nasser will basically rule Egypt um, in a lot of ways that are reminiscent of dictatorship until he dies in 1970. Uh, Nasser is one of these um, pan-Muslim state types of advocates. And immediately when he gets into power, he starts talking about that internationally. He wants to unite uh, Muslim-dominated countries into one kind of super state and uh, views the existence of Israel as a major roadblock in that plan. And he looks to unify support amongst Israel's neighbors uh, to do something about that. Another thing that Nasser does, I mean, he's talking a lot right when he gets into office. Um, You know, politicians talk all the time about the promises they're going to make, but Nasser actually did things. And one thing that especially angered a lot of Westerners was that his government took control of the Suez Canal. So that was not run by a private company anymore, particularly Western companies, mostly British and French. So Nasser's government nationalized, which basically means the government took it over and will run it for government profit. So if you want to pass through the Suez Canal, you pay a fee not to a British or a French company who had theoretically owned it and operated and profited off it for a long time by that point, almost 100 years. at this point, after Nasser's takeover, you pay the Egyptian government. He says this is Egyptian government property and should be run for the benefit of the Egyptian people, which is a pretty common uh, move and statement ba- made by a lot of these uh, new nationalist governments throughout the world. You'll see it in Cuba, you'll see it in uh, Panama, where eventually the U.S. gives over control of the Panama Canal to the Panamanian government, which is a big controversial thing in the United States. Um, but there's pretty common types of stuff throughout much of the world. Uh, The next big move that he makes is to obviously start internationally calling for other countries to join with Egypt. Um, Syria is the only one that eventually does. There is talk in Saudi Arabia uh, and other certain countries around the Middle East to join with Egypt, Uh, but eventually Syria is the only one that actually does. And uh, they call this the United Arab Republic, or the UAR, that exists from the late 50s into 1961. It doesn't exist that long because Syria undergoes a military coup also that will eventually put the Assad family in power. So Syria, once that coup happens, Syria backs out of this kind of Egyptian alliance, and so Egypt is basically the only one left in it. Uh, they have a very open and public hostility toward Israel. And they really start planning war against Israel pretty quickly. So the 1960s and early 70s is a very tenuous time for Israel's survival. And this is where Israel starts uh, taking especially massive amounts of money and weapons, uh, particularly from the United States, uh, theoretically, to defend itself. But there's some questions about how they're defending themselves. Um, Let's see... Okay, Nasser goes on and establishes also political and social movements and helps to create one after another. Those, the most famous of them being the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, in 64. Uh, with the basic theory that uh, Palestinians are the mass majority of people living in this area, and um, at least until Israel was created. Uh, that Palestinians, because they're the mass majority, they should be the only ones who have the right to build a country in that area. So it's a, it's a statement against the international creation of Israel, which was basically forced upon the people that were already living in the area. And this is a, a long-held theory and complaint that obviously is going on 
right into today. Uh, Palestine just basically was not a country anymore. And those people are very angered about it. And uh, if you've been watching the news today, uh, they applied for a statehood in the United Nations and they got it as of about seven hours ago. So these things are still going on. The PLO still exists today. And amongst other groups that are founded to um, try to figure out ways uh, to force Israel to give up the land or to uh, negotiate. And different groups have different tactics. Uh, one of the tactics led by a guy named Arafat is to create a group called Fatah that is uh, quickly moves into being a kind of anti-Israeli terrorist type of organization to launch internal attacks against Israel, bombings, assassinations, and whatnot, to force the Israeli government to give up some of the land. So that's controversial and is right down to this day. And uh, he survived until I think it was 2004 or 2005 when he died. And there's rumors of assassination. He was just uh, exhumed, dug up uh, what's past a week to try to determine if he was assassinated. And there's other groups that get founded over time. Uh, Hamas, which has been in the news obviously today, um, has a lot of political support from the Palestinians. Um, uh, Israel, uh, not Israel, Iran eventually founds Hezbollah, which becomes basically another uh, terrorist type of organization, which also has a political arm, specifically in Lebanon uh, right now. Uh, the Hezbollah kind of political party is basically uh, in charge. Uh, they've won democratic elections in Lebanon, uh, which countries like the United States and Israel are not very happy about. Um, in early 1967, Nasser, the leader of Egypt, threatened to blockade the Gulf of Aqaba, which is down here which is on the border of Egypt's land in Sinai. This area here is known as the Sinai Peninsula, which is largely kind of uninhabitable desert for the most part. Um, but he did this because Israel only has one southern port right there on the tip of the Gulf. So Nasser said that he was going to blockade the Gulf in order to uh, force an economic embargo, basically, against Israel and hurt their economy so that they'd be forced to get back some of the land. Um, it appears that... Uh, Egypt was also preparing for a military attack against Israel uh, and signed on Jordan and Syria, uh, Jordan being here to the east of um, Israel and Syria being one of the larger states to the northeast to all attack Israel at the same time and uh, possibly overrun the Israeli government and take control of the land again. Uh, Israeli spy network understood that this was going on. So Israel actually launched a preemptive attack in what becomes known as the Six Day War of 1967. That was very successful. Uh, basically an air force attack that bombed Nasser's air force and a lot of his army uh, before it could move and also forced Syria and Jordan to give up very quickly, literally within a week. And this, the Israeli army went forth and occupied Egyptian lands, Jordanian lands, and an area known as the Gaza Strip. Uh, also took some uh, defensive territory, good defensive land uh, from Syria, known as the Golan Heights. And this is uh, very controversial because uh, this is the Israeli government growing its land holdings uh, at the point of a gun. So this is territorial growth not through diplomacy or buying land, but just through straight military conquest. They eventually decide to give the Sinai back to Egypt, but they continue occupying the Gaza Strip, uh, named after the city of Gaza, uh, to this day, and a lot of uh, parts of what has become known as the West Bank, and it's called the West Bank because of the Jordan River. So it's literally the kind of West Bank of the river, which surrounds Jerusalem. And that's where you see, uh, specifically up to today, uh, the Israeli government has been building settlements for Israeli citizens to go live in uh, in order to really just occupy and dominate the area so that they would never, uh, they claim would never be capable of giving it back because there's too many Israeli people living there. 
and that's where you see uh, specifically in the negotiations between Palestinians, Jordanians, um, and Israel and Egypt, uh, these talked about uh, Israeli settlements in the West Bank. That's the area they're talking about. So that's uh, controversial also to this day and uh, the source of a lot of hostility. And there's uh, major problems, especially over the division of Jerusalem. There have been calls for it to be labeled basically an international city that no group gets to dominate. It should be open to anyone who wants to travel there. Um, but Israel and the Palestinians say that when they uh, kind of, especially the Palestinians, when they say they want to formulate their own actual country, that they want Jerusalem to be their capital. So that's a point of major contention and has been really going on almost ever since. And Israel has fought uh, several more wars against its neighbors in order to at least keep the lands that they've dominated, if not to extend their holdings. Um, Nasser died in 1970, and his vice president, Anwar Sadat, came into power. Uh, Sadat is uh, basically continuing. He would continue Nasser's foreign policy, especially against Israel. Uh, Sadat plans his own war against Israel. So Sadat is another believer in this pan-Arab type of state, the super state. Uh, launches his own war led by Egypt against Israel in 1973. that can be known as the Yom Kippur War. Um, again, a pretty short military conflict that uh, Israel defended itself and was humiliating to the Egyptians. And after that war, it appears that especially the Egyptian and the Israeli leaderships were willing to try to negotiate some kind of long-term settlement because there are bombings, assassinations, threat of war that is just ongoing for years and years and years. And at this point, uh, especially with U.S. backing of Israel, that it just didn't appear that either side was really going to be able to defeat the other. Um, then you get the assassinations of even of Olympic athletes in one of the Olympics of Munich in Germany in the 1970s. That was an international outrage. So that seemed to uh, be a motivator for the leaders of especially Egypt and Israel to create some kind of peace agreement. Um, the agreement is very tenuous. It's very complex. Uh, so the eventual agreement that uh, U.S. President Carter negotiates between the two is literally a laundry list of different steps, one by one, that have to be taken to create a long-term peace. And it's basically uh, the Egyptians give up on one side, they give up a demand, and then the Israelis give up something else, and then it goes to the next level and the next level, and it goes down, down, down. You're supposed to go down this giant checklist and at the end of the checklist, you're supposed to get a long-term peace between the two. Uh, that's why it's called the Roadmap to Peace. It, it's literally this long and winding document. Um, the problem is that each side, right to this day, accuses the other of not fulfilling their side of the bargain. Like, we gave up our side to start, and then you didn't budge on what you were supposed to do. And those accusations are flung right down to this very minute, back and forth between uh, Egyptian, Palestinian, and Israeli leaders. So they created a checklist and then basically haven't followed it very much ever since. And they accuse each other of breaking the deal. Uh, basically breach of contract. So right down to this day, um, Israel has grown territorially, still dominates the Gaza Strip and Gaza City, and that's where the attacks have happened, where um, every once in a while you get a, a bombing in Israel, or Israel has, decides to attack a PLO leader, a Hamas leader, and assassinate them. And Israel literally runs helicopter gunships all over the place in this area, uh, just looking for what they define as terrorist leaders, and they'll bomb a house and kill a bunch of people and say they did it to get a certain terrorist. Uh, that often causes the Palestinians to uh, launch bombings, or in the past few weeks we've seen uh, rocket launches against Israeli you know, government buildings or population centers or something. And every once in a while you just get these outbreaks of hostilities that are very violent. Kill a couple thousand people at a time. And uh, that's what we've witnessed in the past week or two. And of course, each side blames the other for starting the whole thing. So, questions about any of that so far? Or with Israel and Palestine? Nope. 
Yeah. So Palestine is are those three areas or? Well, Palestine even today is very vaguely defined. Um, Palestinians tend to live in all of these areas, even in Israel. And one of the accusations that Palestinians uh, throw against Israel is that in areas where Palestinians live in Israel, they're basically segregated. And especially in Gaza. That they're basically living under a military type of occupation. They're second class citizens. They don't have all the rights and privileges of um, Jewish citizens. So is it religion or? Palestine? No, it's, uh, it's largely defined as a group of people. It would be like um, Native Americans in the United States uh, for a long time and even today proclaiming that they have been historically repressed and second-class citizens and whenever they kind of rise up to complain, they get attacked and their leaders thrown in jail or killed uh, and their land has been stolen for them or from them. So uh, they're a kind of displaced people within what they view as a hostile government. So it's a big step for uh, Palestine to be labeled an actual country somewhere. And does anyone know what the result of that vote was when they took the vote? It's like, well, it passed. It was like 145 to 9 or something like that. So uh, the Palestinians have the general support of the overwhelming international people throughout the world, the international governments. Um, and it's largely the United States and Israel that uh, blocks things at the UN Security Council. Um, especially the United States. So, whenever you get votes in the council about uh, declaring Israel to be an occupying force or Israel is guilty of war crimes or something, it's, the vote usually goes 14 to 1. And because the United States is the one, they kill those resolutions because they have the veto, to, the veto power. Yeah. So, that's, a, that's historically been happening for decades. So, in this case, will. The Palestine state happen, or well, what was voted on today is that they are um, what's basically called a, a non-complete member. So they they are they are given what's called observer status. They don't have voting powers in the General Assembly or the Security Council. Um, they're like Washington D.C. in the U.S. Congress. They have a representative there. That person's allowed to talk and debate, but they're not allowed to vote. So they, they get to hang out and talk, but when to sway. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. yeah. Where did Israel get their army when they were first created? Uh, they built it as fast as they could, but they also got the absolute backing of the US government. Um, and that's a pol I mean uh, Israel won't admit to it. They're the only country in the world that we know of that has nuclear weapons but won't say it. Because usually the point of having nuclear weapons is to announce it to the world, don't attack us, we'll destroy your whole country. Um, but there are a lot of suspicions that are borne out by a lot of evidence that the United States gave Israel nuclear weapons. And uh, even to this day, Israel does not make its own helicopters. They basically take U.S. helicopters and repaint them and then fly them around. It. Yeah, so uh, that's why you see in the news a lot of um, U.S. companies are boycotted against throughout the world because they they make the weapons for Israel. And one of them is uh, the Caterpillar company that makes these bulldozers that literally go through and level Palestinian homes and build uh, Jewish colonies basically in their place. So there's a, a big international movement to boycott Caterpillar. That's pretty common. It's just stuff that you don't usually hear about on U.S. news like CNN or anything. Uh, okay. Now, uh, going to India and uh, Pakistan. Um, India was obviously, from the start of our semester, a long-term, at first, uh, Portuguese-type colony, and then the British took it over. Uh, British and French moved in in the 1600s, and the British started to dominate it from the mid-1700s forward. So, for about 200 years, give or take, until the end of World War II, India was a British colony entirely. And they ruled it with a heavy hand. Uh, there, whenever the Indian people rise up and demand any kind of rights or equality in India, uh, they're often massacred. Um, there is a type of religious slash political leader named Gandhi, 
who rises in the 1930s and 40s that complains about the British occupation. And he is one of the kind of founding theorists of what we call nonviolent resistance, which basically means, uh, this is something that Martin Luther King later takes on in the United States, that uh, the best way to resist an imperialist or a colonizer of violent government is to march in the streets and to not fight back when they attack you. Because once the news cameras see it and they see that the people are being attacked and they're not fighting back, they're not trying to resist, then you get a lot of international sympathy. And it's a very powerful kind of moral force. So Gandhi is probably the most famous of the kind of Indian resistance types of movements, just like Martin Luther King was uh, for the um, civil rights movement in the United States and later the larger world. Um, Gandhi, as the British go into World War II and they emerge from World War II largely broken, uh, they realize they're going to let India become an independent country. Gandhi's advice was to not split India into two different countries. Uh, what we define as India today as a Hindu majority country, there is an area north of it that has become known as Pakistan, which is and has historically been uh, ever since about the 1200s uh, a, a Muslim dominated population. And Gandhi's message was to not split those people apart. Uh, his message was not very well liked, especially by a lot of the religious extremists, so they assassinated him right at the point where India and Pakistan are becoming independent. So the major kind of national leader, what, who probably could have been a national leader of India, is basically taken out of the equation uh, right at the point of independence. So right as Israel is moving toward being created, you get another major building conflict that becomes also a type of religious conflict also. And at giving this area independence, the British did decide to split what had be, been historically only India up to that point into Pakistan and India. Pakistan being the Muslim-dominated, India being the Hindu-dominated populations. There is a mixture... Uh, in the north, an area called Kashmir. Um, there are problems in Kashmir because there is a uh, somewhat large Muslim population living there that is very nearly a majority, if not an outright majority, um, but run by a Hindu-backed government. So there are problems right off the bat there. And India and Pakistan will fight each other over Kashmir and is still disputed territory to this day that is, has, even in recent years, threatened war between the two. Uh, the rising Indian politician is named Nehru. He was a follower and a friend of Gandhi, more of a politician, though, than a religious leader. He was a lawyer, uh, was involved in the kind of independence movement right off the bat, so was a famous Indian politician going pretty far back. Um, he, in the first Indian free elections, be, he and his party go into power, so he becomes the prime minister. Uh, his foreign policy is, number one, to occupy Kashmir and take control of it. That will eventually, is immediately a conflict with Pakistan, and will eventually lead to open war between the two countries in 1965. So there's a long-term mutual hostility between the two. Um, that becomes even more dangerous when India gets nuclear weapons and then Pakistan does in the 1990s. And they both raise um, secret uh, commando kinds of groups to go into each other's countries and you know, launch bombings or assassinations or attacks. And you've seen that continue even uh, four years ago. There was a big attack in Mumbai, or uh, basically what is believed to be uh, Pakistani kind of CIA type groups backed terrorists uh, went in and basically shot up hotels and killed a lot of people. And then virtually all killed themselves before they could be caught so they couldn't, be, so they couldn't talk. You couldn't tell who uh, gave the order to do this or where they got their training or supplies or support. Um, Outside of Kashmir, 
uh, Nehru's general foreign policy is independence. And this worried, especially the United States. Nehru does not want to get involved in the Cold War. He doesn't want to take support of either side. He wants India to be independent, to stay outside of the Cold War. Which, of course, the Soviets and the Americans view as suspicious. Right? Why don't you want to join our side? We're the future of human freedom and whatnot. And also worried both sides, especially the Americans, because he set what some commentators have called the problem of a good example. That these newly emerging countries through decolonization could be independent of both the U.S. and the Soviet Union in this era of Cold War. That they could make their third way. And Nehru wanted to lead these so-called third world countries that are becoming newly independent, having their own governments. He wants to be a leader of them internationally to create a, basically a third grouping for international prominence. No questions about that at all. Is that where that term first comes into being as the third world is? Uh, I don't, I'd have to look into the history of that term. I, I don't know exactly when it comes into prominence and when it was first used. I just have done that research. I know the term Middle East doesn't come about until about around the year 1900, give or take. Um, another thing that very much worried, especially the American government, was that Nehru was a socialist. And of course, socialists that get put in charge of newly independent countries um, tend to do things that Nehru was doing, which is basically industrialization, um, build up state-owned utilities like electricity or natural gas or um, you know, hospital systems or <clears throat> cheap housing for the poor, education or something, uh, roads. Uh, Nehru is also a good example to a lot of these newly independent countries that they can build things themselves and they can build their societies to be fairly liberal um, societies. They all have free markets for stuff. But the idea is that the most important industries that everybody depends on should be run by the government. That's generally what socialism is. You take government revenue, government funds, to build the stuff that everybody depends on, that's stuff that you don't really want to trust individual companies to run because companies are very often greedy. So do you want to trust uh, a bunch of companies to run like the interstate highway system or to run electricity systems? Because you know, if they start cutting corners with that kind of stuff, you could get a lot of potholes in the roads. Roads could become undrivable. If you put them in charge of natural gas production, uh, they may cut corners to the point where you know, stuff starts blowing up all over the place, which has happened in places where they have gone with private ownership. So there's, a, there's an argument for that. He's not a full-time or a full-fledged communist, though, because he wants companies to run a lot of important industries, and he wants capitalism, profit motive for uh, especially industrial growth, technological growth. Um, but like a lot of other socialist leaders in newly emerging countries, the United States uh, in many ways started to define Nehru as a kind of closet communist. Someone who keeps it secret that he wants to do, he wants to go to full fledged communism, so he may be attacked. Um, the United States eventually never really sought to remove him as much as other leaders in the world that were, uh, in the U.S. estimation, closer to communism or they say, more communistic or closer to the Moscow line or something like that. Um, Gandhi sticks around until 1965, or not uh, Gandhi Nehru. Um, his daughter, Indira Gandhi, no relation to the original Gandhi, but it's just her name, uh, becomes prime minister in 1966. She is assassinated in 1984, largely continuing his policies, assassinated by a basically religious extremist. Then her son, Nehru's grandson, Rashid Gandhi, Gandhi goes into office almost immediately after his mother's assassination, and he sticks in office until he is assassinated in 1991. So you have uh, literally four decades, give or take, of the Nehru family um, in charge of Indian politics. 
and they uh, largely rebuilt India in a lot of ways. It has a lot of problems even today with mass inequality. They have a gigantic population. It's described as the largest democracy in the world. They, they are a democratic government. They have voting rights and whatnot. They have a parliament and a prime minister system. Uh, but a gigantic amount of the Indian people are still living in poverty today. So they have all the types of corruptions and whatnot of uh, democratic systems in other places where you know, rich people invest in campaigns and therefore basically dominate the country. Um, Pakistan had its own internal problems uh, right off the bat also. One of the biggest problems is that Pakistan was actually two different places. It was a kind of northwest of India and it had this little chunk also just on the east. So that was also part of Pakistan. Uh, it was called East Pakistan at the time. And uh, very quickly, there are problems between those two different groups because of the major population. Pakistan today is the sixth largest population in the world, so a gigantic amount of people. Um, the major amount of them are in the kind of northwest section, and uh, different dialects are spoken in the eastern part. So there are different cultural connections, different languages. And when the major part of Pakistan tried to enforce its kind of religious systems and especially its language systems on the east, you get a rebellion in the east that eventually leads to the creation of an independent country called Bangladesh. So that's how that rises. Um, Pakistan has a lot of other internal problems, especially with democracy. Um, Pakistan had a fairly democratic type of government up until the 1950s or so when a military coup was in implemented. And then it goes back and forth between a democratically elected government and then another military coup. So another military coup took over from a more democratic type of government in 1965. And uh, that lasted for a few years until 1971 when a more populist movement rose up and got rid of the dictatorship. And the most popular politician is a guy named Bhutto. Uh, was Western educated, dressed very nicely, uh, a lawyer by trade but a master politician. Uh, became the de facto leader of uh, the newly democratic type of Pakistani government promised a whole lot of reforms, more civil rights, more education, uh, a lot of the stuff that Nehru was really doing, uh, which angered the military uh, who had been kicked out of office. So they came back in um, 1976 in another coup, knocked him out of office and actually threw him in jail and didn't trust him for the long term, so they ended up executing him. And that dictatorship would be in place until the late 80s. And it was a, a really rigid dictatorship also, you know, killed anyone who disagreed, anyone who complained. So it's a Stalinist type of system, but not outright building a communist economy. It's more of just a dictatorship. Um, but they're known for all kinds of atrocities and whatnot. Um, one of Budo's children, one of his daughters, uh, kind of took up his name. Uh, when he was executed, she... Uh, went to, I believe it was England and then the United States to also be educated, went to college, um, became a politician in her own right in the 80s and returned to Pakistan at the fall of the military government. So you're going to have the first elections in Pakistan in quite a long time. And uh, she is a very famous person. Also because she's a woman in a Muslim-dominated uh, society. And uh, in a society, specifically in Pakistan, where there's a lot of resistance to modernization and especially a lot of resistance to allowing women into powerful positions. So she was controversial, had a, a massive amount of support within Pakistan, but there's also a very dedicated opposition movement against her. So her party actually wins the election. She becomes a prime minister in 1988, is knocked out of office in 1990 and is forced to flee the country. Uh, comes back in 93, wins another election, becomes prime minister again. Um, and then accusations of corruption and basically stealing from the treasury are kind of announced against her and her husband in 97. 
So there's another military coup against her in 97. That creates another military government that dominated until uh, 2006, 2007, um, when she officially announced that she would return and run for re-election. And her party was, again, very popular. It looked like she was going to sweep into power again. And uh, somebody assassinated her in December 2007. Uh, which was the final kind of straw for the Pakistani people. They, she had so much support that they basically rose up and demanded the dictatorship leave office. So the dictators are largely kicked out of office, and there's some debate over how much of a hand they still have in the Pakistani government today, especially their, their ISI, which is basically the CIA of their country. It's like a super secret organization within their military. Um, there are accusations that the, that military group... Uh, caused her assassination and uh, still debated and controversial today and uh, how democratic the Pakistani government is today, how much they actually have to respond to the will of their people and through voting and whatnot is still fairly up in the air. So a lot of accusations of voter fraud and whatnot. Uh, her husband is, I believe, the current president of Pakistan, uh, but even last summer, uh, charges of corruption, they were brought against him. They tried to impeach him and remove him from office. So there's a big controversy going on between the Supreme Court that seems to want to do these investigations and he's getting rid of judges and whatnot, so it's still up in the air who's really going to survive this kind of political infighting. But uh, Benazir Bhutto came to represent the schizophrenic nature of Pakistani politics because She's in power and she's knocked out, comes back, knocked out, and eventually gotten rid of for good. So questions about that at all? There's uh, several good documentaries, just not on her, but on Pakistan in general. And uh, when you have a schizophrenic country like this that does not really appear to be di very democratic, and you give them nuclear weapons, or you allow them to develop nuclear weapons, uh, that becomes a, a major worry, especially for the United States. So questions about that at all? No. Um, and that's where a lot of this really is today. Uh, Pakistan has also developed a group called the Taliban in the 1980s and 90s meant to go into Afghanistan and dominate Afghanistan uh, to try to bring it closer to Pakistan, but that went awry. Or the Taliban basically went into Afghanistan and tried to rule the place themselves. So uh, got a slight drop in support from Pakistan, especially in the United States intervened after September 11th. So that's uh, one of the major problems for the United States today is Pakistan is an official ally, but there are accusations that their secret spy agency is still directing the Taliban and supporting them, even against U.S. forces. So there's a big question. Does the U.S. still give Pakistan diplomatic cover, give them money and weapons to defend themselves, even when they're often using those weapons to fight against American troops in Afghanistan? Uh, that problem just hasn't been solved and doesn't appear to even be close to being solved. It's a giant conundrum for the United States. The other side of that being if you allow that government to fall and the Pakistani people get to vote, maybe they'll vote in a group like Hezbollah or something and give them nuclear weapons. You take your risks. But, you know, that's what happens when you play these international types of games. Okay, uh, now going into Africa, the, try to do this really, really fast. Uh, the short story of Africa is that it had been dominated almost completely by European imperialism, as we saw up to about World War I or so. Um, after World War II, again, the Europeans just couldn't afford to keep their empires, especially in Africa. Uh, Africa largely wasn't even all that profitable for them because the uh, African people were so difficult to repress. Uh, so you get a slew, a giant amount of independence movements throughout the whole continent. And you can see most of these are located in the late 50s and 1960s, where a huge amount of the continent just very quickly becomes a series of independent governments. And uh, this wasn't always peacefully. Especially the French tried to keep control of their uh, colonies in Algeria and Morocco. And that inspired resistance movements in those areas that were 
uh, label terrorist organizations, and that was one of the problems of French foreign policy in the 50s. Um, how do you keep control of these areas? And eventually it's decided they couldn't. So there are mass bombings and attempts at assassinations uh, throughout the area. Uh, the large problem, one of the largest problems of African independence is that they have, by that point, lived with almost 100 years of European imperialism. Um, the Europeans went in and basically tried to suck resources out of Africa and didn't seem to care very much for the uh, development of the continent as you know, any kind of industrial power very much. Uh, the Europeans basically went in and built factories when it was useful for the Europeans and built railroads where it was useful for the Europeans and didn't seem to care much about uh, really growing the African economy. Uh, so right down to this day, most Africans are still stuck in, or yeah, still largely stuck in basically a 1700s unindustrialized economy. They're mostly farmers. Uh, another major problem is that when the Europeans went in, they got rid of a whole lot of different crops that the Africans used to farm because the Europeans went in with the idea that you should just grow one place in one er or one thing in one area, grow a whole lot of it, and then you can export it and get enough cash to reinvest to build railroads and bridges and whatnot that the Europeans found useful. So a lot of the African economy, the, even the farming economy, has been decimated. They're just not growing a whole lot of different things. They have a few staple crops, which means in an agrarian economy that is dedicated to growing just one crop, the same thing happens there that happened in the United States in the 1700s and early 1800s. When you grow only cotton and the price of cotton goes down, your whole national economy can be destroyed. So it's basically um, oversimplification of the economy. And of course, when you have a whole lot of people growing the exact same thing, what happens to prices? They go down because there's a whole lot of supply. And there's a lot of debate raised about did the Europeans do this on purpose in order to keep the African economy down, therefore keep the African people uh, poor, weak, and powerless enough to dominate to the long-term future without having to have a military presence there. You basically rule them economically so that they can't really build much for themselves. And there's uh, talk about European or American economic imperialism, not so much military anymore. And that's a, a common accusation throughout much of the world. You rule them with money and debt. And that's just as effective as sending in your troops. And in fact, a lot cheaper sometimes because troops are expensive to keep up. And uh, there's a lot of accusations that groups like the International Monetary Fund and World Bank that were built in the aftermath of World War II to fund rebuilding efforts, uh, that they have become predatory, that their large role in the world today is to give gigantic loans to impoverished countries throughout the world give them giant loans up front and tell them, we're going to give you a whole bunch of money. You can pay it back in small increments over you know, 30, 40, 50, 100 years, whatever. And you can use that money right now to build hospitals and bridges and railroads and industry and all that kind of stuff. So you can grow your economy to the point where you can make the payments easily and you can get into a cycle of economic growth and prosperity. But a lot of these loans were given at such gigantic interest rates and the loans were inflated. Um, there's a lot of accusations that companies were um, basically giving these loans to keep those governments in debt. And if a government is in debt and they can't repay, then you go to that country and say, um, why don't you sell your oil to us very cheap, below market prices? Or sell your wheat to us very cheap? Or um, vote with us on the next UN Security Council resolution? And if you ever compare um, as much as you hate paying for gas in the United States, compare that to how much the British pay, or the French pay, or the Australians pay. It is far, far lower. I had a student over the summer who um, just moved. She had grown up here in California and moved to 
Britain and stayed there, or the UK, whatever they're calling it now. Uh, stayed there for <laughs> like 15 years or so and got married, had kids there, and just recently came back this past year. And uh, she said that her and her husband sat down and did the calculation because, you know, British pounds and they use the metric system and whatnot to figure out how much they're paying per gallon of gas. Anyone want to take a guess over there what the equivalent of a gallon of gas is? $18 a gallon. And Australia is even more. So, you know, you guys complain about 4 or $5 a gallon. To them, is a joke. And uh, there's a lot of accusations that this is the reason why. It is, but they don't have uh, they don't have the access to oil that we do, because the United States has close ties to a lot of African governments and especially Middle Eastern governments that sell oil to us below market prices. And here's a couple of cartoons that I found on the internet that depict um, what the accusation is. Uh, they call these uh, structural adjustment programs, where if you can't pay your debt, they're going to restructure the debt to figure out a way to you know, allow you to survive it. And a lot of these are very destructive. They take money out of education. They take money out of health care. I mean, all kinds of things, all kinds of government programs for the poor. And uh, they basically funnel it to uh, paying off debts, which oftentimes are owned by investment companies on Wall Street. When you get these, these companies, even private individuals who own like the official government debt of uh, Ghana or something, you know, these billionaires who own the, foreign, the government debt of a foreign country, and uh, they go in and take up huge amounts of land or just suck out the resources. So that's a common accusation. Uh, another major problem, of course, is that when the Europeans went in, they didn't care about any kind of political or ethnic or cultural divisions or religious divisions amongst the native Africans themselves. The Europeans went in for natural resources. Therefore, they went in to dominate and redraw the map of Europe for European interests and ended up splitting up a lot of the native African populations. So when you get a place like the Congo or Sudan that are eventually built up to be European colonies, uh, they draw the map where it's useful for European access. And they often split people apart. They draw a map right down in uh, the middle of an ethnic community. They don't really care. And when the Africans complain about this in the 1800s, it's fairly easy to repress, repress them because you have machine guns and they don't. The long-term problem for this is that when the Europeans started to allow the African countries to become independent after World War II, the old colonies are basically the exact same that become the new countries. Therefore, a lot of these new countries have tons of different minority groups because they've been split apart for so much. A uh, country of Zaire, I think it was, eventually has like 75 different national languages. So they are just clusters of these different groups. And when you have votes in a lot of these countries, when, if they have democracy, if they have any kind of democratic institutions, um, you can have a bunch of different political parties and no one group can get a majority of the vote. And the natural result of that is those groups who feel that they are dominant or powerful, the way they look to keep power is to eradicate the minorities. And this is where you start to see uh, the reemergence of genocide movements, uh, particularly in Africa, uh, ever since independence in the 60s. <coughs> and uh, there's accusations that this is going right on this very moment. There's a revolutionary movement in the Congo. And uh, one of the worst recent instances is in uh, southern Sudan, place called Darfur, where 400,000 people were estimated to be massacred and millions kicked out of their homes. And again, that's, uh, the map is confusing. You get the borders changing often. You get very frequent coups. And you get a lot of uh, small-time dictator dictatorship types of regimes that look to stay in power through violent means because it's uh, sometimes, in their mind, the only way they have to stay in power. If you actually allow the people to vote, that they'll vote you out. Um, there's also been calls uh, ever since the early 1900s for a pan-African movement to get rid of the European divisions. And join the African people together in one African super state. And there are a lot of calls for this, specifically coming out of a country called Libya since the 1960s. 
where a military guy named Colonel Gaddafi was a major leader, especially of a North African movement to unite all those countries, major oil producing countries, into a super state. And it was obviously opposed by the United States. Um, in 1963, a new organization was created called the Organization for African Unity, which has evolved to become known as the African Union, which is a kind of European Union or a kind of African Congress uh, that has still, even today, dreams of bringing all these countries together into a, a super state, like a United States of Africa. Um, it is very heavily rejected and uh, kind of halted by European powers and the United States because uh, Africa has probably the most natural resources in almost any continent on the planet. And if those countries got together and were really independent, uh, they could become one of the next major world powers very quickly. So the old idea uh, that the Europeans inflicted on Germany, uh, that if the Germans ever got together, they would dominate Europe. And therefore, for a thousand years, the Europeans, especially Britain and France, stopped the Germans from getting together. Um, that kind of idea is also very powerful in Europe and uh, North America. And similar calls have been given in uh, Latin America by Che Guevara. And uh, a lot of these leaders are assassinated. And uh, Malcolm X was, uh, right before his death, was a big proponent of this stuff. And that's why he uh, largely coined the term African American because he wanted to unite the repressed classes of the United States, North America, and Africa and you know, join them together politically. And uh, he was around for a long time talking about his ideas of racism and whatnot. And once he started talking about that, he was killed pretty, quiet, pretty quickly, within a year and a half. And he traveled to Africa and met with African leaders and uh, went to the UN and gave speeches. And, um, there's a, a lot of ideas that uh, this stuff has to be stopped in certain quarters uh, to keep uh, the dominant countries today dominant for the, the far future. <laughs>